much. Thanks very much, Craig, and, and good, good morning, everyone. Um, I, I had the pleasure of, of working with Martin uh, a number of years back when I was at, at Bernardo's, and, and we're going to talk a bit about leadership, and I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that experience then. But, but I think uh, many of those people who have worked with Martin, whether that was in the prison service, in the National Offender Management Service, in Bernardo's, or, or in other ways, um, know and experienced um, the, the fact that he's a, a really exciting person to work with, uh, inspirational, always trying to push things forward, do things differently, uh, challenging and creative. Uh, and, and those are some of the things we'll, we'll touch on today. But, but for me, I personally learned, learned an awful lot from, from working with, with Martin uh, about leadership and, and how to do it and, and how to approach it. He's also got phenomenal insights around government, uh, having worked with, with so many politicians and knowing so many politicians across both the main political parties, in fact, um, and indeed, you know, the voluntary sector having led Bernardo's. So, so Martin, I, I wanted to kick off with thinking about the fact that, you know, we're all here today. It's an extremely challenging time for all of us with the pandemic, uh, the state of the world as it is. Um, and, and thinking back for you, you know, what, what for you was, was the most challenging time for you, either in uh, leading the prison service or uh, leading NOMS or in Bernardo's? Uh, just, just tell us for you what the, the, that time that was most challenging and, and how, you, how you kind of faced it and dealt with it. Uh, I think I think if you just take yourself off mute, Martin. Sorry. Sorry, I thought I thought you would come come try that. Well, morning, everybody. Very good of you to to join me this morning. Just before I answer that question, Andrew, what what's the? I can't remember what our timing is. How long have we got this morning? So, so we, we've got till about ten o'clock. I, I will ask. We'll do a bit of Q and A. People will start doing put right. questions in the chat, and then I'll facilitate questions and answers. Okay. Well, uh, the answer to that question is. Um, uh, undoubtedly, the most difficult time was uh, running prisons. Um, I worked in, in and around prisons for 23 years, ran the prison service for seven years, the probation service for three years. Um, uh, the darkest days were in prisons and were generally to do with suicides. Because although I went through a period, I, I was quite, quite a fortunate uh, Director General and first Chief Executive of Norms because I, I, I got a lot of money, the Treasury were pretty generous. Uh, and I spent a huge amount of money on trying to stop people committing suicide in prisons and failed lamentably. Uh, 574 people killed themselves on my watch and 19 of them were kids, 19 of them were children and uh, I couldn't stop it. Thanks, Martin. Um, a, a, a sobering thought that, uh, uh, and at the time when Martin was uh, running the prison service, I, I, I was, a, was, a, was a young thrusting, uh, wanting to change the world person at the Prison Reform Trust and, and trying to hold Martin's feet to the fire on that. Uh, he, he didn't always appreciate what, what, what I had to say. I didn't, uh, <laughs> but I did um, appoint you when I had the chance to end them. Yes, you did. So you must have liked something I said. Um, <laughs> And, and you've obviously, you know, you've been in the prison service, you've been in government, you've been in the voluntary sector. And just reflect for us a bit about the, the difference experience leading across those, those different areas. I, I've, I remember you saying at, at Bernardo's that one of the big things you found was working with people who were essentially social workers. It was very difficult to get them to do things because they're incredibly independent minded. Whereas in the prison service, you could almost pull a lever and things would go down the line and happen. Uh, I'm sure you've got other reflections on differences uh, across the two, two operating environments. Well, well that, you, you, your recollection is right. And I found uh, moving from particularly prisons, it would have been worse for me if I hadn't been working close with the probation service for a few years. But prisons, for all the difficulty and for all that the Prison Officers Association is, it's uh, still a largely unreconstructed 1970s trade union, particularly in times of crisis. The prison service responds well to a bit of command and control. So I, I could put out essentially orders from the director general's desk and I, I knew that something would happen in Dartmoor as a response to that. Uh, I'd only been at Bernardo's uh, a few weeks and we got the first indication that uh, of the existence of a much greater threat to children 
and, and the people might have been joining the ranks of our charity and other charities to try to sexually, sexually exploit children. So we were having to look urgently at some of our volunteers and, uh, and indeed some of, some of our staff. And I sent out a, an urgent notice telling all my regional managers and uh, managers in Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales to do certain things about safeguarding audits and to do them immediately. Uh, and then as I went visiting those regions and nations, I found out that hardly any of them had done any of it. Um, what I'd considered to be a, an unequivocal and direct order they thought was an interesting proposition worthy of a bit of discussion. Uh, and I could try to change 7,000 social workers, or, I, or change myself, and I decided to do the latter. <laughs> and I, I just found that with social workers, as with other professionals, the real sense of vocation, you have to, you have to have that conversation. It doesn't mean that at the end of the day, they won't do as they're asked, but they expect to have a conversation about why things are being done. So I, I spent a huge proportion of my time at Bernardas doing this, except like talking to staff wherever I want, went, trying to explain why we had to do things. And uh, often leaving, often disagreeing with them. But it wasn't, it, it, it was that conversation, that participation, that opportunity to answer back, which was vital to them. And I couldn't change things without that. And, and that change in, in leadership style for you then, was, was, that, was that a big adjustment? Did, did, did you learn a, a lot from that, kind of leading differently in different contexts with different staff groups? Uh, yeah, I, I do. I, th I think Bernard has made me a, a, a better leader. I had leadership foisted upon me running the, the prisons. I, I got the job of Director General in 1998. I was relatively young. I was only, I was 40-something. Uh, I was... I just joined the prisons board. I was the youngest person on the prisons board, generally by a decade or more. I got the job because nobody else wanted it, or the the, the one person who did want it, government didn't want them. You know, so I I know three people, two people who went on to be permanent secretaries in other government departments, and someone who's played a, a huge senior role in the private sector, who were offered my job. Uh, uh, and I was discouraged from applying. I was told I was too young and too inexperienced. I got the job that nobody else wanted. Uh, and that, uh, that tells you something uh, about the, the, the challenge. Uh, so I had to learn a lot about leadership very quickly. Uh, but, but my learning in Bernardo's, I think, built on what I learned running a major public sector organisation. Which do you prefer working in, or do you, I mean, do you, do you have a preference to, to, today? Would would you would you choose to be in in the public sector again, or would you choose to be in the voluntary sector, or would you go kind of hybrid social enterprise? Uh, the, the most important years of my working life were in and around prisons. It was an enormous privilege to do it, and uh, I like to think that in some basic ways, in terms of the decency of prisons and the and the dignity. <coughs> Which prisoners are treated that I, I made a difference um, but it was pretty miserable most of the time uh, one of the shocks for me for Bernardo's was how much I enjoyed work they were the happiest years of my working life um, but in which was more worthwhile than actually it was prisons because it was desperate and uh, trying to make things a little bit better for those we incarcerate uh, was a, a hugely, hugely important task. And I, I never, uh, I never ever, I, I try not to over exaggerate here, but you know, so I didn't transform anything. That's the word I'm always suspicious of when people talk about public services. But I do know that I made the living experience for people who were incarcerated, who are mostly fundamentally disadvantaged in every way, I made life for them a little bit better. And how did you, you know, you talked about those, those suicides on, on your watch and some of them being children, those, those most darkest, difficult, challenging moments, how, how did you cope with those uh, as, as a leader? Well, I think uh, you, uh, you get a perspective on this afterwards, uh, uh, and I've realised only since then how much it affected me personally. I'm not saying, oh, look at me, I'm a poor victim. Of this. I didn't, I, I didn't lose, a, lose a loved one, and I've met plenty of parents who lost kids and tried to explain to them how, how that happened. Um, 
to try to send a signal to the organization. This is a big organization, the prison service, you know, 42,000 staff, 140 establishments. Uh, if anybody committed suicide, there was an absolute requirement to phone me straight away. So day or night, I would always get a call and, and uh, my belief was that that would send a signal that this really was my first priority. And I did say publicly, uh, to the consternation of, a, of a, one or two ministers, I did say publicly that reducing suicides was much more important than reducing escapes. But the fact that I got those calls meant that I, it, it, would, it would be quite burdensome sometimes because you know, people, people caricature prison governors as tough, as very tough, hard people, and some of them are, but you know, some of those tough, hard people have wept on the phone to me on a Sunday morning when they've discovered that somebody, particularly a, a child, has, has died. It's, it, was a, it was quite a strain. It made quite, a, it made quite a, an invasion into my family life because a lot of suicides happen at weekends, a big proportion, because suicides, you know, if the Samaritans were here, who, who incidentally are an unequivocally marvellous charity, if the, so, so, if the Samaritans were here, they would say that, as I said to people potentially suicidal, you, you may want to die today, but you may want to, you might not want to die tomorrow, but locked in a cell for many hours, people turn upon themselves and particularly young people don't realise how very, very easy it is to take your own life, particularly by use of ligature. So some of those things were probably, that's were probably unintended, but they happened frequently over a weekend. So I'd get those calls quite a lot. And uh, so it, it was, a, it was a, a, a big burden to have. I take some comfort from the fact that after I left some of the things I did, removing ligature points from every cell in the prison service, um, hugely expanding our work with the Samaritans to provide what we call listeners, prisoners or actors as, as, as Samaritans, it finally started to have an impact and numbers fell for quite a few years. But at the time, I just felt that we, no matter what I did, we couldn't make, make things uh, get, any, get any better. Thanks for sharing, sharing that, Martin. Brendan, who, who's on uh, and is experienced in the criminal justice, has, has, has uh, put a, a question in chat about, about you know, working in, in that environment and, and the increasing shift towards a kind of risk-based culture of bureaucratic processes um, and, and how you manage that, that balance between um, kind of those those constraints, those risk-based approaches, and professional judgment, exercising professional judgment. Um, I, I remember when um, Tim Lawton became children's minister under the coalition government. You know, he made a big point about trying to uh, give back to social workers the opportunity to exercise their professional judgment, arguing that they'd be constrained by too many bureaucracy and a straitjacket of, of lengthy guidance. Um, what, 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 what's your view on that, Martin? Well, on, on, to, on, on giving social workers more autonomy and so forth. Yeah, on, on, on the balance between giving staff, you know, enough autonomy and discretion and, and making sure, you know, you gave the, the example previously about how you had to write, write out to managers in Bernardo's, expecting them to do safeguarding audits. And, and that balance between, you know, managing risk and, and, and bureaucratic constraints and, and freeing up people to make decisions and exercise professional judgment. I think that... Uh, I think the, pro the problem I found in social work is uh, not just with social workers in Bernardo's, but looking across social work more generally, and Amber, you played a huge part in this, was uh, uh, making sure that those decisions, if they were those more autonomous decisions, were going to be evidence-based. And um, one of the things that quite surprised me is that uh, people in the probation service think that, that, that won't remember me very um, warmly from my time running norms because they thought it was a prison takeover and indeed that's what it became but it wasn't what I intended norms was going to be and uh, it, it was uh, I, I resigned on a matter of principle over Charles Clark's refusal to, to follow up a promise to, to uh, reduce the pop prison population but actually I had a very positive view of probation and my, what I found with, with a, a typical probation officer, if you had a discussion with a typical probation officer, almost random, about what works, about what the evidence said about offending, they would have a pretty good grasp of that. I found in social work there was a 
quite a lot of romanticism, uh, sometimes a lack of evidence. Um, the care system, I, I, when I arrived at Bernardo's, I, I led a huge a noisy public uh, uh, information program about how awful the care system was uh, and why children shouldn't be taken into care. That got Alan Johnson and Secretary of State to uh, get me to lead a, 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 a public inquiry about reducing the care population. Thank goodness at this point, you arrived, Denver, and did some research and said, actually, I'm not sure the research says this. And it was a, it was a revelation to me, but more to the point, uh, all the, it was a, when I said this publicly, when we said this publicly, and if you remember, we had to be very artful and get demos to say publicly as a way of making a greater impact. We sort of did all the work and they published the report. When we said what remains to be the truth is that the care system actually overall is good for kids. Kids do better in care than they do being left in what used to be called managed neglect. Um, that, 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 was a, that was a huge step forward. So my, my worry about autonomy is making sure that that autonomy is based on evidence and not romanticism. And it's a, it's, a, it's a real problem with kids living with great disadvantage today. The general view, the Guardian view, if you like, is still that we take too many children into care. There is no, no evidence for that. Uh, we take children into care, return them home, and 60% of them are harmed again neglected again within two years. Of kids coming into care in the teens, 40% of them have been in care on four or more times previously. Um, but uh, the social work profession is still some way from making decisions based on that evidence. And uh, I've written reports and I've had ministers agree to a, a complete new educational curriculum for social workers at university. Um, but I'm afraid it hasn't yet, hasn't yet happened. And there's a, quite a crisis out there. And, and I, I just want to stand back a bit now and think about the, the voluntary sector, the third sector. I, I know, you know, from having worked with you and, and, and kept in touch over the years, you, you, you haven't held back from criticising the voluntary sector sometimes. Um, and, you know, saying that actually it's not necessarily as, as good as the public sector. What, what's your view about, about that? Well, my, I think you will, I have been critical, but mainly of large uh, voluntary organisations who I think often squander the opportunity they have to make change for the better. Uh, I think if you... Uh, certainly, if you're running a, 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 an organisation as I did, as large as Bernardo's, with uh, a very big public reputation, a, a huge income. You know, people, I was at Bernardo's for six years. This will upset all of you running tiny organisations and uh, are impoverished. People gave me a million and a half pounds every week. That was what the voluntary income was at Bernardo's, a million and a half pounds every week. Nobody ever asked me what we were doing with that money. So we had a huge amount of money, a real opportunity to make a difference. And uh, I don't think we did a, enough. And I think big charities don't do that. I think there's, uh, there's too much emphasis on, on getting media headlines, uh, on, on, on you know, persistent outrage, and sometimes uh, an unwillingness to try to work with government. And... Uh, Richard Nixon, when he was president of the USA, once said, it's remarkable what you can achieve if you don't worry about who takes the credit. And uh, that was my experience, certainly, but now, can I, have you got time for me to tell one story? It's important yeah. because it's, it's the most important thing I ever did in my working life. And I can tell it now because it's, it's all, all, all gone. I once discovered by accident on a visit to one of our Bernardo's projects in Manchester, I discovered a a, a, a mum, she was from uh, uh, Rwanda, and she had a, 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 a boy who was eight year old. They both had, they were both HIV positive. They were about to be repatriated, uh, to, not Rwanda, to Malawi. And of course, there were no uh, drugs there, anti-retroviral drugs there for them, and they were going to die. And the heartbreaking thing about this poor mum, she was called Joyce, was she, she genuinely didn't bother about herself. What she worried about terribly, what all she would talk to me about was that when they get back, she would die first. 
which she would, and then her son would be by himself before he died. And I found that there were 52 of these children um, across the country. Lisa, Lisa Nandine, our Shadi Foreign Secretary, then at the Children's Society worked with me on this, we identified 52 children. And uh, I, I spoke at a Labour Party conference, I tried to get to see Liam Byrne, then the Minister of Immigration refused to see me. I got to see Home Office officials, I was given the cold shirt, I was told I was difficult. Uh, I was told that uh, my name would be knocked off, off uh, the honours list, uh, not told official, but told about it was. But I eventually, bless her through Sherry Booth, who was my president, I got into uh, with Tony Blair behind the chair. And I took Tony Blair this photograph, because this, this is still on my desk now. Um, I took Tony Blair this photo. This is one of the girls who was, uh, as you see, model student, just joined secondary school, doing rather. She was one of the 52 in the families who was going back to Africa and would die. And eventually I made a deal, a grubby deal with the Home Office, that they would allow all of them and their families the right to stay, it's 240 people. The deal was I said not a word, and I didn't say a word. The new statesman had helped me in the early part of the campaign. They agreed not to say a word either. So by being quiet, we managed to save the lives of all those kids and the families. It was incredible. It would never have been done if I'd followed the, the traditional line of shouting these successes from the rooftop. And I think that's a dramatic example of just what you can achieve if, however difficult this government is, if you try to work with them a little bit, you can, uh, you can achieve a great deal. I'm sure, Ember, you, for all your uh, quite proper horror of some of the things Pretty Patel is saying, I know you're pragmatic enough to continue to keep avenues of discussion open with her officials, because she's not there forever. And you've, you've got to get yourself a reputation as someone who will support them when they do the right thing and perhaps be pragmatic about not achieving all you want, but making some modest improvements. And I don't think big charities do that enough. Thanks, Martin. That, that was a very powerful uh, uh, and amazing story. And, and Sarah's put, put that in, in the chat. I'm, I'm keen to get colleagues uh, involved in, in asking Martin questions, sharing some re reflections um, at, at this point. So, so we, we, we open it up. Um, if people have got questions, if you, if you put them in the chat, or if, if people want to, to ask Martin anything. Do I need to open chat or will you? No, no, the formula. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll check it for you, Martin. Yeah, don't, don't, don't worry. Um, or if people want to speak, they, they can they can come in, uh, raise their hands. Uh, I, I'll, I'll kick things off. Um, uh, you, you, you alluded briefly earlier, just earlier, Martin, in the last but one passage to, um, you know, having a on a point of principle um, with with um, you know leaving your job. And I just wonder what your what what your views were on on where the penal system is now. Um, we seem to like locking people up in this country quite a lot. And um, will it always be thus? I will, once uh, Cherry Blair was a fantastic president of Bernardo's. The, the, unfortunately, the, the, a lot of the members of Bernardo's didn't like it very very much, and and uh, we had to let we had to let her, let her go and revert to having a member of the royal family. But she was terrific, and she. I don't know if you, some, some of you, you remember, some of you might be too young, but she set up a thing called the Downing Street Lectures, where she brought to the Prime Minister's ear things which meant to her. And I did the second of the Downing Street Lectures. And the deal was, she, it was a very sort of husband-wife thing. She sat her husband down in the room and told him he couldn't leave. And he didn't. <laughs> uh, I described uh, our approach to, to uh, prisons as having a love affair with custody. Uh, and I see no prospect of it changing, frankly. Uh, the reason I resigned from the Home Office was, was that uh, I got on very badly with David Blunkett, and I'm not being modest there. If you, if, you want, if you want to pick up his diaries next time you see them and look in the index, you'll find quite a few references to me, and, and they're all offensive. <laughs> we, we, we got on pretty, pretty badly, but uh, I, I did and do admire him for all we rowed about a great deal. And he was an incredibly courageous politician. He agreed with a, 
a man called Harry Wolf, and the Lord Chief Justice, who Enver will know very well, and who was one of the most remarkable men I, I've ever met. He agreed that between them, the Lord Chief Justice and the Home Secretary would cap the prison population. Now, not reduce the prison population, the prison population was 74,000 then, and they agreed to cap it at 80,000 and set in work, sentencing Ghana, so it would never go above 80,000. And uh, we got that into legislation. Um, a, a bill had gone through the House, Baroness Scott undertaking the bill through the House of Lords, which is about to go into the Commons. And then David Blunkett, some of you might remember, accelerated the granting of a visa for his nanny, had to resign, ludicrously in, in, in my view, but had to resign. Charles Clark came and Charles Clark in his first week in office tore up the bill. It never went into the Commons. And the opportunity to capture the prison population was lost. Uh, and that's when I, I resigned. The prison population is 86,000 today. Uh, and I'm afraid I see no prospect of it, of it reducing. Uh, the only way it can be reduced if we get someone brave enough to tackle sentence inflation. It's not that we send too many people to prison. Uh, it's not that we're sending more people to prison. It's we send people for, for ludicrously long sentences. Uh, I got Michael Gove quite interested, who I consider a brave politician when he was a justice. I, I got him quite interested in, in doing this and he's expressed some regret about not doing so, but that's what we need to do. You know, if you, there's very little difference in terms of retribution between a 16 year sentence and a 12 year sentence. Uh, and if we reduce sentence lengths, we could significantly cut the population, but I, I'm not very optimistic about it. Uh, and I, I think I think the people who are running the, the, the prison and probation services now are having a, a pretty torrid time. Thanks, Martin. A, a, a couple of questions in, in the chat. I'm, I'm going to take a couple and let you respond to, to each uh, briefly and then and then bring more, more in. Um, one, one from Judith around uh, operating in politically loaded circumstances and, and debates and situations and, and what has helped you to preserve your in, integrity. And then another quick one from Rachel around your time at Bernardo's and, and you, you saying that you, you, you wish that uh, you and the organisation had achieved more. Is there anything you'd, you'd, you'd do differently if you had your time uh, again there? So one around integrity and, and one around uh, being at Bernardo's and whether you'd do any differently, anything differently. Um, in integrity, it, integrity, it sounds a bit, a, a bit pompous, but I think to use the old fashioned expression, I think your job as a civil servant is to speak truth to power. And I've, I've sometimes fretted that I might not have done that enough because you, you have to bend on, on some things. Um, other, otherwise you don't get anything done, but I sometimes wouldn't have, whether I, I did do enough, I, I've been a bit encouraged. There's a, there's a, an interesting book about to be published by uh, Roy King and another criminologist at the, at the University of Cambridge about uh, a history of the of justice policy since the 1980s. And I was rather pleased to read a proof of that. And, and uh, Charles Clark described me as, as the most difficult civil servant he'd ever worked with. Uh, and it, I was so chuffed <laughs> because I thought, well, perhaps I was, you know, uh, Doing that, but you, but you've you've got to do it pragmatically. You can't survive as a senior civil servant if you, even if you don't accept the politics of it, which you often don't. You have to try to do what ministers want within reason, and, and there's an awful lot of damage limitation. I used to think that, well, I've often described managing prisons, particularly to young leaders of organisations who who have understandably but naive ambitions about transforming the world the, the reality for me in running prisons was a if things didn't get any worse in a week it was quite a good week um, so i think speaking truth to power is, is really important it's very very difficult in politics because ministers change so often i i run prison service for seven years if i count secretaries secretaries of state and junior ministers i have 15 ministers that's the equivalent of the chair of the board at Bernardo's, I had one chair for six years. Uh, you can imagine which organisation got more strategic stuff done. The second question in terms of what might I have done differently 
uh, uh, Bernardo, uh, I think we should have, uh, I think we should have been kindly and more supportive to small charities as someone here from Home Start. Uh, um, we, we made life very difficult for Home Start. We, we blitzed into some of their contract areas when I now realize we shouldn't have done. Where we saw smaller organizations doing things terribly, we should have pulled out. Uh, instead, I'll take some accountability for, for trying to get us to grow too much. We became very successful. We grew 40% in, in, in four years, but I think we damaged some smaller organizations and we should have helped some smaller organizations out financially. We did a couple of times, but we should have shared some of our wealth with smaller organizations and not believed that everything had to be delivered through us. Yeah, I, 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 I wish the similar CEOs of the big charities were here, here, here listening to that. It, it, it's, a, it's a very, uh, I think, important um, re reflection. Um, a, a question from Scott around the, the current you know, COVID uh, crisis and, and the environment we're operating in. And, and arguably politicians and, and government have become more insular uh, as a consequence of, of the situation we're in and the, of the pandemic. How do you think the third sector can have a, a stronger voice in, in lobbying for change now? I think the third sector can have a huge job in guiding us out of this and we can see the end of this, I, I be believe. I know we've had false hopes in the past, but all the data on vaccinations and deaths is so in encouraging. Um, but we have to set up a different sort of world after after this and we have to cope with the cost of it all you know we've now got public debt at 97 percent of gdp since 1960 it's probably going to top 100 percent um we're going to have to be very we're going to, have to make some very difficult spending decisions and i i think the the third sector can have a role in that i don't know if there's from the list of people here i don't know if there's anyone here from charities representing the elderly but um one of the things I, one of the difficult things I think is we have to recognize is that if we want to help families more, and some families are in desperate states, we have to look at the largesse which has been heaped upon people like me. It is ridiculous that I now get a winter fuel allowance. In a few months, I get my free bus pass, free travel when I go to London, and free travel on all the buses here in and around North, North Yorkshire. Uh, Elderly benefits desperately need taxing, for example. So the winter fuel, give me the winter fuel allowance if you insist, but make sure make, make me put it on my tax form. Uh, we have some difficult decisions to make. We won't get out of the debt we're in with just more taxation. And some of us who have been doing rather well in life have to pay more tax. And particularly people of my age group, who are many of us are, are much more affluent than you lot are going to be when you reach 66. We need to pay a little more and give up a little bit more. And I wish, um, I wish some of the age concern and other charities would try to identify between the need to look after the elderly who are genuinely impoverished, while accepting that the rest of us should make a few sacrifices. Thanks, Martin. We're, we're, we're coming up to uh, the closing. I think we've got time for a, another one from, from the room and then, and then I'll have a, a final one. Um, you, you, you talked about times of, of big pressure. This is, this is from Lisa. Um, uh, times of big pressure and, and difficult times, times that, that were tough, quite, quite miserable, personally difficult to cope. Um, what, what advice would you give to, to others uh, now le leading in, in times of, of kind of crisis? And, and sometimes, you know, I, I know there's colleagues around the room that, that where, where staff, they'll have lost staff as a consequence of, of COVID and, and the pandemic. Um, what, what, you know, from all your years in leadership, what would be your one bit of advice uh, um, to colleagues? I, I, one of the things I, I enjoy doing a great deal is speaking to young leaders of, of, about this and I, I tell a few stories and, and then um, draw up a list of, of sort of personal rules that I've developed. If I just chose one of them, it would be um, about the value of having doubt. I think a lot of the leadership literature 
is just garbage. In fact, I'm rather pleased for years and years, I've been berating Rudy Giuliani, who's now about to go to jail, I hope, about his, his, his book on leadership, which is, which is the single worst book on leadership I've ever read. Um, in that book, he talks about being told when the second twin tower had been hit by the Pan Am plane. And uh, apparently he just rattled off the seven things that, there and then that needed to be done to save New York. And uh, I'm not sure that was ever true, but all I can say is that my experience of dealing with crisis has been that my first sense has been, I don't know what to do. Uh, I was a very young assistant governor at, at a, what was then a, a Borstal before the days of you know, Fender Institutes when I, I experienced the only ride in a prison in which I actually worked. The, the governor was aware, the deputy governor was aware. I was very junior, I was my second year in. Uh, I had to, to manage that, I had to go to the command suite and tell people what to do. We couldn't get in touch with the governor. This is, pre-mobile phones, it was in 1984, uh, and I had to manage it. And I, I didn't have a clue what to do. And people keep seem to be shouting orders at me and instructions and, and we fumbled through it. And finally, we got all these young boys who had been running around the grounds after escaping from their rooms. We got them all locked up. Everyone was safe, no one had escaped, no one was injured. But I thought, I thought I was completely deficient because I thought I should have known how to do these things. I thought the good leaders had some intuitive sense of taking control. Uh, and when I went in the next morning, I came home in the middle of the night, told my John, my wife was here somewhere, that I wasn't up to the job and I thought everyone knew I'm going to be in trouble. I think, I think when I get in the next morning, the governor might tell me I, I, I couldn't do the job and I had to think about another career. And sure enough, when I went in that morning, I was called at the gate to go straight to the governor's office. And I thought, oh Christ, this is it. And when I went into the governor's office, the chief officer was there. This is the days when uh, prisons were, were formally run by chief officers, ex-armed forces almost invariably. This might have been in the Coldstream Guards and you know, with epaulettes and things on his shoulders. I mean, he stood there and he'd been watching me the whole night managing this. And I thought he'd come to tell the governor. And the governor said, Martin, I've got a full report on the chief officer of your managing the riot last night. I thought, well, this is it. And thank goodness I didn't apologise because the governor said, the chief says you, that you weighed up every uh, potential action before taking the right decision. Uh, and the, I didn't have a clue what I was doing, but I've remembered that story for 40 years and I've tried never, never to take an important decision without getting other people around me and getting them involved in it. And doubt is really important. Certainty is really dangerous. And self-doubt is really important. And I mentioned that then because some of the people here might have been told that something is in them should have been given with this innate ability to make immediate decisions and make the right decision. Life isn't like that. Harness doubt, trust it and involve other people, and you will always, always make better decisions if you involve other people. You have to be a bit of an actor, you've got to show a bit of confidence. You can't say to people, hey everyone, I don't know what to do, but get them involved and you'll make better decisions. Brilliant, Martin. I think that's a really good note to, to, to finish on for everyone to, to take away this morning as, as they go on to, to the rest of their day. Uh, you usually insightful and thanks for sharing so many of your stories. Uh, I think uh, everyone who's been here has, has really appreciated it. So, so thanks very much. Craig, do you want to say anything before we, we finally wrap up? Um, j j just, just a couple of things, really, Enver. Um, just like to thank you for for uh, for, for 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 doing today's um, hosting. I, th I think it it's that's I, I put in the text. I think it was a really marvelous session. Actually, I was I was just enjoying it so much, and and I think um, the the relatability of so much of what Martin's had to say today, I think, has really resonated with with a lot of us. Um, particularly the 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 the, 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 the stuff about you know the you know, managing in crisis that you, that you said just now, um, but 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 many many other things. So I, I think I think for, for, for although we're not all young leaders, I think we've we've many of us have, have have gained a lot. I think from from hearing from you today, Martin, and we're we're really really 
glad that, that that you could share that with us so um you know it's, it's 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 a huge sort of sense of gratitude really that i want to impart on on behalf of all of us um so um in, in the remaining minute or two before you all get on your way i'd just like to uh penny just to 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 to, to announce what we've got coming up in the next week or two uh, just so that people know and are reminded penny on mute need to 